Right. Can you all see my screen okay? Right. If I'm using my notes, um, can you see my notes or can you just see the screen? Perfect. Fantastic. All right. Great. Well, um, well, that was a lovely introduction already, so I don't need to say anything more about, uh, about myself. I'm here today to really uh, present the evidence uh, and what we know so far in terms of research and practice of nature-based art therapy is an area really, really close to my heart and I've read so much about it and I'm always excited to talk about this area. So I hope you find some of this information uh, useful today. Um, a little bit about myself, I, I like introducing myself with this uh, slide, um, but I was originally qualified as a teacher back in Greece, where I'm originally from. And this is where I discovered a, a very strong interest about play and play with children and what, how that helps to release emotions and share experiences that they wouldn't share with me otherwise. And so that made me uh, move to Cardiff and uh, to the University of South Wales to do a master's in therapeutic play. And then um, this is where I discovered a, my strong passion for, for research. So when I was doing my dissertation, I discovered that this is the career I want to follow. Um, however, uh, my English was not strong enough to um, work therapeutically in the UK and also it was a big financial crisis in Greece. So that made me move to China, uh, do teaching for a couple more years, but I was pursuing at the same time uh, an online master's from the University of Sterling in clinical research. And this is what helped me then get a PhD, a fully found PhD in art therapy. So I moved to Liverpool to Edgefield University. And this is where I ran a, a, a trial, a pilot, a randomized control trial of art, music, drama, and dance form and psychotherapy. And then following that, my postdoc was uh, about a project called Eco Capabilities, which I'm going to talk about later on. But essentially, this was artists working with children in primary schools. We were taking them ch children outside for one full day a week. And um, because um, I'm originally from Athens, like I said, and I recently found out that Athens is apparently the, the city, the European city with the least green space. And so I had never been to a, to a park in my life until I was about 24. And so having this opportunity to work in nature for a whole day every week had a really strong impact on me. And this is really since then that I started exploring how can we do more art therapies outside in nature? And also what are the practical challenges around that? So I'm gonna be focusing on that today. Uh, these are the books that have really inspired me the most. So I really want to reference them here in, in case you wanna uh, look at them. A lot of the things I'm, I'll be talking about today are focused on these uh, books. But one interesting thing that we notice when we're looking into those titles in, is how different terms we're using. So you can see that some authors have preferred terms such as eco art therapy, some others prefer environmental art therapy uh, or nature-based art therapy. So first of all, I was really curious to understand, is there any difference depending on what term we're using? And also, does it matter? So I started to dig in a little bit on that and understanding the different uh, terms. And so these are the five terms that I'm, I'm coming across uh, more often, I guess, when I'm um, reading various articles or, or, or book chapters. Uh, but my understanding from, from reading all those resources is that nature and outer-based art therapy, it, it's, they're more straightforward terms. It literally means that we deliver art therapy in nature and outer spaces, but they don't necessarily have to do about the, the environment or, or the climate, climate crisis, although may as well some of these things naturally emerge in the uh, conversations. However, environmental and climate-informed art therapy, they're much more about focusing on the, on the environment. Environmental is a bit broader than climate informed, so it doesn't have to be about climate specifically, but climate informed is slightly different because it's focused on the uh, climate, on climate psychology, which is a relatively new field, but essentially it is rooted on uh, understanding the human responses to climate crisis. And according to um, climate informed art therapy or climate informed uh, therapists, uh, responses such as eco-distress or eco-anxiety or ecological grief are very much 
wanted appropriate responses to climate change. And it's actually a sign of connection and care for the environment. So we're not really, when we're saying that we're delivering climate informed art therapy, we're not really trying to reduce those feelings of eco distress or eco anxiety. What we're trying to do is support people to manage those emotions in a more productive way. And, and finally, the term ecotherapy, although I found that it's the most commonly used so far, it is such a big umbrella term that thus far has escaped the unified definition. Uh, I found that only the American Association of Art Therapy has tried to develop a definition of eco art therapy. However, it still appears that there are as many uh, definitions as there are practitioners. But uh, I think it's important to think about when we're using those terms. For example, if we're working with young people with experience of eco-anxiety, perhaps then it's appropriate to say that you can support them by providing, let's say, environmental or climate-informed art therapy. However, if you are working with some people who might not believe in environmental crisis, or perhaps they have other more uh, pressing needs, such as dealing with poverty, if you say to them that you're um, offering uh, sessions on environmental or, or climate informed art therapy, they might, they might not think that this is something of relevance to them or this is useful to them. However, if you say that you're delivering a nature-based art therapy, they might think that that's something that they want to engage with. So I think it's really interesting to reflect on those terms when we're using them and how that can impact whether or not people want to engage with us or want to participate in the sessions. Now, regardless of which terminology we're using, all of those terms are ontologically underpinned by ecophilosophy. And ecophilosophy is essentially the turn from the an anthropocentric worldview, where we as humans consider ourselves as separate or superior to nature, to a more ecocentric worldview, whereby its being has meaningful existence and we should respect that. And eco-psychology is essentially the multidisciplinary field, which is emerging from uh, the combination of ecology and psychology. And ecotherapy is simply the practical application of eco-psychology. But as I said, it has escaped a unified definition so far, and there appears to be as many definitions as there are practitioners. However, when this term was first used from uh, Kleinbell back in 1996, the term was used to describe this reciprocal process whereby healing in nature, healing in nature is also healing for nature. And that is because when we are, essentially when we're in nature, it, it motivates us, we gradually connect with nature and that motivate us to wanna to take care of nature and preserve and, and conserve nature. So this is why a lot of uh, the, the previous authors from the books that I mentioned before have, are arguing that healing in nature can be healing for nature as well. Looking into art therapy specifically, I have tried to see a little bit about what do we know so far and what we don't know so far. Although this practice has been widely used for a while now, the evidence behind it is quite limited so far. So I'm going to take you through some of the studies that uh, a couple of those studies that are quite significant in this field, but also uh, a couple of the studies that I have conducted so far that might be of, of interest and relevance to you. The biggest study that we have so far was conducted by Deborah Elkis Abahoff uh, back in 2022. So this is the largest study that involved 75 participants. Uh, it was primarily participants who did not have access to nature. So it would be uh, people who were hospitalized, disab disabled or living in uh, rehabilitation or learning facilities, prisons, or even during COVID-19, they engaged some people who couldn't go out of their house due to uh, the COVID-19 restrictions. And following the sessions of art therapy, uh, they found that the, they found statistically significant uh, changes in sat satisfaction with uh, life but also they found that uh, increases in positive effect and reductions in negative effect based on the standardized questionnaires that they used. And higher scores were achieved for people who were coming from rural communities who potentially had access, well, I guess more access to nature than people living in normal, um, uh, urban communities. Another really interesting study was conducted, well, it's not more, it's not a study, it's more than a, a practice. It was uh, by Pamela Stanley. And um, uh, sorry, it was actually a research study, not a practice, well, a combination of both. But essentially, they tried to 
to deliver uh, in and out art therapy studio. So the uh, people had opportunities to uh, attend our art therapy sessions um, outside, but also inside doing inspired, um, nature inspired art making. But essentially they worked with people in patient adult mental health services and gave them the opportunity to visit areas such as uh, wild, uh, wild wooded areas, uh, ponds, uh, really diverse spaces. And the, the focus of the art therapy there was to understand how our moods can change by uh, moving from one place to the other. And the aim of this art therapy practice was essentially to act as a stepping stone that would support people to move from the inpatient settings to returning back home. So really helping them with these transitions. Another, um, a, a, this, is, this is the practice rather than a study, but it's a, from uh, Pamela Whitaker, who is talking about Groundswell. And essentially Groundswell is, a, is an outdoor nature studio and a forest garden where art therapy, uh, where Pamela Whitaker's uh, art therapy is taking place. And um, Pamela is describing some really, really interesting techniques that we can all use in our therapy practice. Um, one of these techniques is called the, the walking studio and essentially asking people to focus on the process of art making during pedestrian, uh, pedestrian travel. So traveling from one place to the other as a form of geo, uh, psychogeography. So as a form of understanding our psychological responses to specific locations. And another really interesting technique that she was talking about was the imagescapes. So it was the collection of those artworks as a metaphor, as a map of our lived experience, but also as a metaphor in terms of documenting moments as they uh, emerge and pass away. And one thing that Pamela is really arguing is that we should try to focus more on using found instead of bought objects. So think about what can we find in nature when we're working in nature that we can use in our art therapy practice. And this was, according to uh, Pamela Whitaker, this would help us to maximize sensory engagement, but also it would help with our connection to nature. There is a lovely quote from Pamela that I would like to, to read here, who is uh, arguing that, Becoming part of the landscape situates art therapy outside within the movements of society. As such, participants discover pedestrian serendipity, unexpected occurrences and happenings that enact personal reflections, insights, and therapeutic content. The therapeutic relationship bestows an agency to work within society as a cultural practitioner. And so what this means for art therapy is that the world at large inspires an analysis of identity and the collective. I really like um, this quote from, from Pamela Whitaker because it really captures how working in nature can support our sense of identity and sense of, of place as well. Another really interesting study with uh, children and young people was uh, conducted by Lily Boone. And uh, Lily Boone was really focusing on how using arts uh, and nature-based materials can, can help the art therapy uh, process. And what she found was that by using uh, nature-based materials it would help the children to express their aggression more safely. Uh, it also gave them opportunities to explore existential themes of, of life, death, change, loss, and new beginnings. So things that they would be very difficult to approach otherwise, but we can do that using nature-based materials. It also gave children the sense of potency of, or control. So for example, working with trying to manipulate sound, there is something there quite empowering um, that helps children in sense of control. But actually uh, another quite significant finding from this uh, practice was that it, using nature-based materials in our therapy practice helped children to gradually start to feel more connected with nature and feel like they belong there. There is another lovely quote from Lily Boone that I would like to include here. And Lily Boone is arguing that breaking a stick is not the same as breaking a paintbrush or a pencil. It gives license and a container for healthy expression of anger, not directed at themselves, the therapist or the room. The sense of potency and control that comes with this, such as in the creation of mess and the symbolic expressions of defense is a necessary part of moving through anger to fear and grief beneath. I think it's a really, really powerful um, quote. So I would like to, to share that with you. And, and finally, another really interesting uh, study was by Ariel Eglinton. And um, really what um, they were trying to 
promote this sense that we should try to practice being in nature rather than just visiting nature. So how can we really, really feel that we're being there? And um, in, um, in, the, in this chapter, basically, uh, there was a lot of focus on trying to attune uh, ourselves and the art therapy practice with the gradual changes that are happening in nature. So all those things that all the opportunities that come up with the changes in the seasons and how we can take advantage of that in the art therapy practice. But uh, for me, the most important part of, of in this chapter was uh, this quote here that says that the land upholds ideals, ideologies, cultural and political identities, which we should not be taking for granted. So we should not be taking for granted what every place might mean for, uh, for, for different people. So for example, a place that can be a source of national, of national pride or belonging for some people, the same place could be a source of memories of forced movement or displacement for some other people. And our therapists would really be mindful of their client's geopolitical connection to nature or this land and the emotional experiences that arise in relation to this space. So we, should, we shouldn't take for granted that visiting an outdoor space, it would necessarily be a positive experience for everyone. Um, sorry, I can hear some... Um, talking on the background yeah. I'll, i'm just gonna move on um and again i guess that this is a quote that very much captures that that says that however large or small these felt experiences can become deeply symbolic standing for something hidden dark disturbing shameful or repressed when our exposure within nature becomes too much too cold, too wet, too mucky, too dry, too hot, too prickly, too vast or too emotional, then we meet an edge between oneself and one's limit. And here there are opportunities and challenges, a place to be tested, to push further, a place where we might challenge and redefine our sense of self. Again, I think that's a very, very powerful uh, quote there from Igliton. So looking into all of those uh, studies that have been done so far, the most common, th these are some of the most common things that are, themes that are coming up from all these studies. First of all, is that when we are doing our therapy um, in, in nature and outdoor spaces, it helps us to gain perspective. It helps us to take a stand back, a step back and look at our lives as a whole. In a way, it can make us feel reassuringly uh, small, like uh, Kate Sutton has mentioned. And this experience can be comparable to a flight experience. So imagine when you're flying, when you see from your window, all of those people um, underneath and all of them having their own uh, lives and situations and problems they're dealing with. Similarly, when we're working in nature, we can start noticing all those uh, animals and beings that are all having their own lives and can help us perhaps take perspective, perspective take a step back and look at our, our, our lives as a whole. Another thing that is coming up um, more and more often is that it allows us to, to express ourselves perhaps more uh, safely and sometimes stay with this discomfort in a way that somehow still feels safe and comfortable in nature or when we're being outside. Another thing that uh, nature-based art therapy really helps with is understanding our special positionality of our emotions. So the understanding the symbolic importance of some places and how these trigger some emotional responses to us. Uh, so again, that was something that was coming up from all the, the, the articles and the chapters that I was reviewing. And it can also have, um, working in nature can have grounding effects. This is very much confirmed by uh, uh, neuro studies in neuroscience that prove how working in nature can help to cull both our brain and our senses. For example, even the simple act of a gentle breeze against our skin can relax our nervous system and improve our self-regulation according to uh, neuroscience studies or even seeing landscapes can increase the production of serotonin in our body, which is how many antidepressant medications, at least in Western medic medicine, this is how they're working. So nature can have all of those effects. It can also help us to explore existential themes of life. So things like death, change, renewal or loss. And it can also allow us to explore the, the seasonal changes that are happening in nature can again help us explore of all of those themes of birth and death and growth that mirror the life changes. 
Um, there is a lovely quote again from a uh, McMaster published in 2013 that says that, that says that every time a plant dies or a material decomposes, therein lies an opportunity to discuss death and express a full range of emotions to, to feel heard and less, uh, and less isolated. Um, and another lovely quote from uh, Sikritan uh, uh, about, um, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll get to that in the, in the next theme. But uh, in terms of the um, a, a sensory engagement, like I said before, specifically the study from Lilibun, uh, who found that uh, by engaging with nature-based materials, it helped us to engage our senses and, and that gradually they can uh, connect us more to nature. And finally, the thing that is coming up more and more often as well is how working, doing our therapy in nature can help build compassionate care for nature. And uh, Sikritan said that as we, be, as we begin to understand more of our own wounds, we may begin to better understand the wounds that we inflict upon our planet. So really discovering ourselves when we are in nature, it can help us understand the impact that our actions can have on nature as well. So these are some of the most common themes that are coming up uh, from, from nature-based research and practice so far. Um, in, in one of my study, what I try to do is I try to understand how through the arts uh, we can build higher uh, connection to nature. Um, essentially, uh, be because there are not that many studies in art therapy, I decided to review studies focusing on arts as well as art therapies. And I was focusing specifically on children and young people. So this is a systematic review that I did last year. Uh, it was published in Frontiers in uh, Psychology. You can find the reference um, at the end of the presentation. But essentially what we were finding out was that arts would, who was acting as an inclusive medium to, to increase connection with nature, make the relationship with nature more explicit, but also help children and young people to understand environmental issues and to explore ways to prevent uh, future environmental disasters, which in, terms, which in turn would lead to a higher environmental sustainability. Uh, in this systematic review, we also focus on some specific activities and how this um, led to higher nature connection. Um, for example, we found that when we're doing arts in nature, this made uh, children and young people want to spend more time in nature. So, for example, some, some young people who might essentially, at the beginning of the sessions, they wouldn't feel that comfortable being in outdoor spaces through doing arts they gradually start to feel more comfortable being outside and they gradually felt more feeling more connected to nature there were also from this review uh, we found some identity focused uh, and and self-reflective uh, creative activities that essentially those help children to gradually uh, see themselves as part of, of nature and nature as part of themselves. So this, has, this is what has been defined as a pro-environmental identity. So we found out that identity-focused activities can help with pro-environmental identity. Also, uh, a creative activities that help us to understand what can be done to prevent future environmental disasters is what led to higher pro-environmental behaviors. So not just caring for the environment, but trying to take protective actions towards the environment. And also those activities help uh, some children, young people to um, manage the, their emotions of eco-anxiety and eco-distress. There were also some really interesting activities related to uh, community-based creative activism and which showed how this would then help to bring more positive behavioral changes at the, at the whole community, so collectively. And all of those changes essentially can and, and encourage, well, can bring um, environmental sustainability, but also encourage more time, uh, and, and, sorry, encourage more people to want to spend more time outside uh, and start their own set, uh, circle of, of feeling connected to nature. Uh, again, this was a very uh, large study, so you can take your time, and if, if that's of interest to you, look at it at your own time. But there are some very interesting, fascinating findings about specific activities and how they can help us connect with nature. And the other study I wanted to, to, uh, to talk about, uh, like I said, it's uh, eco capabilities. This was this project was founded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council. Uh, essentially, was uh, situated at the intersection between three issues: 
uh, children's uh, well-being and, and a concern around children's well-being, their disconnect from uh, the environment, and, and also a lack of engagement with the arts and school curricula. So what we found uh, in this study where um, artists were working with children and they were taking children out to nature for uh, one full day every week for, for eight weeks. We worked with uh, 101 children in total. We found that uh, doing arts in nature helped them to develop those eight, what we call eco capabilities, um, autonomy, uh, safety, identity, uh, emotional well-being, um, relational, relationality, both with human, but also with non-human. Uh, they also um, promoted, the, the session promoted their sense of imagination and, and their sense of spirituality. Again, in the interest of, of time, instead of talking more about the study, I want to really present a very short film, um, which is only two minutes long, that describes the impact that these sessions had on the children. And it's coming from the children themselves. So it's a bit more uh, powerful, I guess. Um, I hope that works again. Okay you can all uh, hear it. We get to go outside to the park. We normally make it about what we are inspired by, like all the plants were inspired by bugs and birds. By arts books and like how they did different things in art of the world. It definitely made me like think how lucky we are to have such a beautiful world. We need nature because we can't survive without nature. There is so much inspiration in, in working outdoors, but the children said it was wild, it wasn't like getting into nature, it's like you are nature. And I think that's physicality, but being nature is so important. It was like meditation, meditation to think, meditation to imagine. By offering creative and art activities, it invites them to actually slow down and engage with nature. And the nature gives them materials, the palette, the inspiration, and then uh, the freedom to, to create, to intervene in the environment. So much more full of life so much more confident in building friendships um not with the usual children they would play with they're taking more risks it's taking on slightly more like leadership roles as well and that's also transferred into the classroom he's sort of more confident for one child has shown better listening skills for definitely because he's been so interested he's been more engaged to write through doing the drawings and writing but the artist really they made them look really closely and they discovered things that they didn't notice were there before. It's been lovely to see those children who don't normally excel in so many different areas of the curriculum finally um, come out their shells. They do more stuff outside. When you're outside, there's lots of space and it's calm and it's really peaceful. Yeah, it's peaceful. Yes. Yeah, the gates. Um, I had one perspective on nature. I didn't really like it, but when you took when you took us there, it gave me a different perspective on it, and now I really like it. We didn't even need songs because the birds were singing for us. So I hope that that gives a bit of an overview about the how, the impact that the sessions had on the children coming from the children themselves, which I found very powerful to hear them talking instead of us uh, say, saying what we think that happened. Um, so so um, there are also a few upcoming studies, um, I, although there is not much at the moment out there in terms of evidence of nature-based art therapy, all three art therapy journals have uh, a call at the moment opened to for submissions for nature-based art therapy uh, research and practice. So at the International Journal of Art Therapy, we have a special issue uh, with a deadline in March 2024. So we very much invite a submission on nature-based art therapy. At the same time, the Canadian Journal of Art Therapy and the American Journal of Art Therapy, they also have their own um, special issues coming up in 2024. So if you are uh, uh, doing uh, work in this area, please check them out. It might be a great place to submit uh, to submit your studies. 
Um, and then finally, in terms of future directions, looking at all of those things as a whole, thinking about what where, where we're going next, what is needed in terms of in terms of research, research primarily. So first of all, I think what we need is more realist evaluation. So trying to understand what works and for whom. I don't think we should assume that all people have a good relationship with nature and we should not take for granted that they want to be, the people want to be outside. So I think really need to focus on, on that, what works for whom, or focusing specifically on, on some groups such as people with disabilities, how we can make things nature-based and therapy more accessible, more inclusive for them. Uh, but also think about, for example, the current conflict between Israel and Palestine, where Muslims or Jewish people would feel safe and comfortable, and they wouldn't have to worry about uh, about their safety when the, when when we're working outside. So we really need to be mindful of of, of the contextual uh, changes in our society and how that can affect whether or not people want to be outside and which places they want to be at uh, specifically that they want to work at. Um, Again, we have a lot of great studies, uh, pr practice-based studies that focus on the process of nature-based art therapy, but much less on the outcomes, so what outcomes are being achieved. Um, we also need a bit more on, on understanding how we can develop more sustainable materials. So, for example, the fact that all artistic materials come, come wrapped up in plastic. Obviously, this is something concerning for the environment. So how can we make sure we use more sustainable materials, but also more culturally sensitive uh, materials? As with everything, we need more on co services that are co-produced and co-designed with service users. And because we're working outdoors, there are so many challenges that are coming up uh, that are coming uh, because of that. So we really need to be mindful of the accessibility and the inclusivity issues and essentially the feasibility issues that are coming with working outside or in nature. And I think what we need is not, we're nowhere near experimental or large studies. I think what we need at this stage is robust, really good quality um, studies to, to understand what, how can we improve um, our therapy outside uh, or, or, in a, or in natural spaces. And finally, I would really like to end this presentation with a, one of my uh, favorite quotes from Eleonora Deuce, published in Harvey in 1908, which says that, if the side of the blue sky fills you with joy, if a blade of grass springing up in the fields has power to move you, if the simple things of nature have a message that you understand, rejoice, for your soul is alive. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak this event uh, to this event today. It was it was a pleasure to um, it's a pleasure to be here. If you I know it's a lot of information, a lot of studies um, and, and practice that I, I I talked about. But if you want to discuss about any of that in more detail, feel free to email me or or find me on Twitter or social media. I'll be more than happy to to respond to any questions or have a discussion around that. Uh, there are references at the end, you, you can check them out at your own time, because I'm sure everything will be shared afterwards. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, I hope you found that um, uh, useful.